Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. Today, we'll hear from some of the members of the Animal and Plant Health Agency team conducting research to develop a gray squirrel oral contraceptive and species-specific feeding hopper. You may be aware of the excellent media coverage earlier this week on our fertility control progress, and thanks to all those that were involved in that. I do just want to highlight one aspect of progress that was in the official press notice, but was not really picked up by the media. Um, and I want to take this opportunity to let you know that we're celebrating reaching our fundraising target for the research phase of the programme. <clears throat> so thank you to all those that have been involved in and supported this work so far. Uh, contribution, contributions came from across the conservation and forestry sectors, uh, including the wonderful UK Squirrelical Signatories uh, from private individuals and estates and grant making organisations. And I want to reiterate that this is a collaborative effort with lots of people working together and we really could not do this without you. There are four phases to the fertility control programme. This research and development phase, uh, which we're in at the moment, will end in January 2024. Then we will go on to the landscape scale field trials, uh, which are in development. Uh, then we will move on to testing and registration, which is also in development. And finally, there will be the widespread availability of the final product. So our fundraising focus, our research focus is still on this until January 2024. But our fundraising focus will now shift the landscape scale field trials, the testing and registration phases, um, and also UK squirrel record activities to raise awareness and share knowledge on the issues and solutions. So with that said, I want to introduce you to our speakers today, who are all from the APHA. And you'll hear from Dr. Giovanna Masai, followed by Bex Pinkham, Sarah Beetham, and Simon Cross. And we'll have a question and answer session after the presentations. I have a few questions sent in during the registration, but if you have any questions during the webinar, please put them in the question and answer, uh, question and answer function. Um, this just helps me to collate all of those questions that you want asking. There is a chat function as well, and you're welcome to use that to talk amongst yourselves or uh, talk, maybe try and talk to the speakers, but we'll try and keep any questions that we really want answered so we can record them for the webinar to the Q&A, put them in the Q&A session. Um, great, so I will now hand over to Giovanna, who will start us off. Good morning, everybody. My name is Giovanna Massey, and I'm leading the project entitled Delivering and Developing Oral Contraceptives for Gray Squirrels. I would like to start with an overview of the project for those of you that uh, are not aware of the full project. Um, and then, as many of you might know already, the project runs along three parallel lines, namely the development of an oral contraceptive, the delivery of an oral contraceptive, and the modeling of the impact that fertility control or and culling have on the population size of the squirrels or the gray squirrels. In the next few slides, I, will, I would like to describe the research framework and the list of questions that we needed to answer to develop practical applications of this method. And I hope this conveys the complexity of this project in all of its three areas. I will then leave the floor to my colleagues uh, and each of them will talk about the individual line of research. And at the end of their talks, I'll summarize our findings and talk about our future plans. So in terms of um, developing oral contraceptives, we needed to address a number of points. We need to explain to our colleagues in the ethics uh, review panel, what was our rationale and obviously all to all the funders, which was the rationale for choosing potential contraceptives. Then once we had chosen potential contraceptives, we had to evaluate their effect on reproduction, but also their side effects. It's 
quite important, as you can imagine, also to monitor the longevity of effect and to establish the dose and the frequency of dosing. An oral contraceptive is unlikely to work in a single dose. So we need to think in terms of how many doses and when to give them to, to the squirrels. And there's an important point that Bex will make later about the theory versus the practice. We always start testing uh, contraceptives in laboratory trials where we can choose how much to give and when to give in terms of contraceptives to, to animals. That's definitely not what happens in the wild, which is why we will have also Sarah's talk, talking about what squirrels in practice do in the wild and how do we put together the information that we gather from lab studies with the information from the real world. We also have to talk about, think about best timing uh, in relation to the squirrel reproductive physiology. When is the best time to deliver contraceptives to have the biggest impact on a population? And then because uh, we test our contraceptives initially on rats, laboratory rats that we use as our model species, we need to transfer what we know on uh, rats to the target species, in this case, the gray squirrel and to test in captive gray squirrels. And again, Bex will talk about the joys of breeding squirrels in captivity, which is not as easy as it would look. And then finally, we had to evaluate, or we have to evaluate the effects of bait formulation on contraceptive effect. The contraceptive will be delivered in a bait and the composition of the bait might affect the effect, the effectiveness of the contraceptive. So we have to address this point too. In terms of delivering contraceptives, we often say, um, even if we had a contraceptive registered and ready to use tomorrow, how on earth would we give it to 3 million gray squirrels? So we looked at many uh, factors that will affect beta uptake by squirrels when the bait will have the contraceptive. And in particular, we looked at individual patterns of bait uptake, asking if we put a bait out with a contraceptive, will individual squirrels eat enough bait? What are the factors affecting bait uptake? Is it gender? Is it season? Is it the density of squirrels? And these are not academic questions because we need to know all of these, uh, we need to have all of this information in order to optimize beta take. Um, Sarah will talk about it, but for instance, if males were dominating the feeders, the feeding at the feeders, uh, we would really miss a lot of females. And that's one of the examples why these questions matter. Uh, likewise, we needed to assess at population level, what is the proportion of the animals consuming bait delivered contraceptives? And this will be tackled both uh, by Sarah in the field and by Simon through um, the modeling. Uh, a typical question that everybody will ask all the time is can we exclude non target species? Again, this sit with Sarah uh, and we'll tell you how we have addressed this. Uh, and then what is the practical effort required for successful contraceptive delivery? How do we go about doing it? This is important because um, in February, Kay Ho and I had a meeting with Lord Bennion and Lord Bennion asked a very pertinent question that was, okay, even if you have everything ready, will it work in practice? What steps are you taking? for this to become a practical tool. And then finally, uh, the spatial distribution of bait delivered contraceptive. If you put contraceptives in an area, uh, presumably you, you will affect the squirrels of that area, but also will you be affecting all the neighboring squirrels and how far from the place where you put the baits will you be affecting the neighboring squirrels? And finally, uh, on the modeling, um, this is Simon Croft uh, field. Uh, again, lots of questions. How long to eradication? 
uh, or to uh, target re reduction in population size. Uh, can we compare fertility control and culling in terms of efficacy, feasibility, and cost? What are the factors affecting recolonization, which obviously makes it will make a difference if we want to work at local level rather, rather than at regional level? Uh, will wood composition or mass tier affect the results of fertility control on population? We all know that squirrels, uh, squirrels reproduction may be affected by mast, years where mast is uh, produced in large quantity. So Simon will address this question. And then again, this is the same question that Sarah had, but this is in a modeling framework. So what is the predicted effort required in time and space for fertility control to make sense? And I'll now leave the floor to the so-called squirrel team and uh, wrap it up later. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Giovanna. Bexie, have um, I guess that's over to me then, is it? Yes, um, it's over to Bex. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I'm going to talk about what we've been doing on the laboratory side of the project. Um, so this is about the actual development of an oral contraceptive. So as you just heard, we've got the three strands of the project. Um, so my strand is the first strand where we're trying to identify um, a contraceptive that would be suitable for use in grey squirrels. Um, so a lot of you might have heard some of this before, but I thought I'd go a little bit further back into the background of trying to develop a contraceptive. Um, so first we need to decide uh, what to target in a squirrel's reproductive system. So in all mammals, the reproductive system is triggered when the hypothalamus produces GnRH, which is the gonadotrophin releasing hormone. Um, and this oversees the production of sex hormones in both males and females. Disrupting any or part of this process, um, we can cause infertility in both sexes. And um, so if we target the GnRH here, um, we can cut out the rest of the uh, cascade and um, preventing the action of this hormone at the top um, can prevent, prevent everything um, downstream. Alternatively, we can look at trying to target some of the hormones lower down the cascade. Um, so we can look at preventing either the action of testosterone or some of the female hormones um, to try and you know, reduce infertility in either sex. Now, there are some options available for contraceptive, um, especially in wildlife. We can use things like um, injectable contraceptives. We can use surgical sterilization. Um, there are things like contraceptive implants where you can use some captive animals. Um, but obviously these work along the same of roots, looking at hormones and things like that. Um, as a group, APHA and our partners, we've been working on these type of contraceptives for a long time with a variety of different species. Um, and we can measure the success of these contraceptives uh, through the actual reproductive output in an animal. Um, we can measure it through looking at hormone levels uh, before and after treatment. And in the case of contraceptive vaccines, like there are a lot of injectable um, options available. Um, you can measure that through the use of measuring antibody titers, um, like we've seen for, for COVID and things like that. Um, however, in most cases, this isn't ideal. So obviously to use an injectable contraceptive, most of the animals will need to be captured for treatment. Um, particularly for squirrels, where we have millions in the UK, this is something that just isn't feasible. Um, it's not going to be practically possible in terms of the effort involved. So what we need to look for is um, an oral solution, something that can be delivered more easily. Now, collaborating with a range of British and international partners, uh, we've been building on some really good past results to try and reach a maximum infertility target through treatment. Um, throughout year four, the year three of the project, moving into year four, um, we've been testing multiple options that have the potential for use in grey squirrels. And um, so these are three new candidate oral contraceptive um, formulations. One target of study has been an oral immunocontraceptive vaccine using the same kind of technology that you see in injectable versions, but trying to convert it into an oral solution. We've tested two different candidate vaccines of this oral contraceptive vaccine. 
Um, these are made up of a recombinant protein combined with immune system stimulating adjuvants to try and get a really good immune response. And the other candidate that we've tested um, isn't a vaccine, it's a alternative type of contraceptive using a chemical that's designed to inhibit cholesterol and subsequently decrease reproduction. So the work conducted um, in year three was across all these um, three candidate contraceptives and the work conducted in year four um, has been focused on the two strongest candidates, which were the uh, one of the contraceptive vaccine formulations and the, uh, the chemical contraceptive. So first I'm gonna talk about the chemical contraceptive. So that was Dazacon. So this one isn't a vaccine. Um, it's, it acts on an animal's cholesterol levels. So cholesterol is a sort of a building block um, for some of the reproductive hormones. So if we reduce the level of cholesterol, we should achieve an infertility effect. Now the, the, the formulation that we're using is called Diazacon. And it is a cholesterol mimic. Um, so it binds to the specific enzymes that cholesterol would, um, and then prevents the production of uh, cholesterol itself. So in other species, they found that reducing normal cholesterol levels by over 40% should be enough to cause infertility. So that's what we've been looking for in giving it to squirrels. So squirrels, um, obviously, unlike humans, they are seasonal breeders. They have two peaks of breeding throughout a year, and they have hormone cycles that rise and fall with the two yearly breeding periods. So what we've been doing is applying um, a treatment and then tracking the effect over this expected rise and fall in hormones. So we delivered this contraceptive in a hazelnut paste, um, which is really attractive to the squirrels. Um, they, really, they really love the stuff. Um, they will tear things apart to get to it. So we've been mixing the diazacon um, in with this bait and giving it to our captive squirrels. Um, what we found was really promising. We had a lower testosterone, le testosterone levels across uh, this season where they're expected to peak in testosterone levels in our, in our male squirrels. So that was really encouraging. But um, we did have quite a lot of variation in bait uptake with the squirrels. Um, yeah, we had this trend for lower testosterone and we had uh, lower cholesterol levels as well, but their bait uptake was a lot lower than we were hoping for. And it was really variable in between individuals. So we're working with um, collaborators, a company called Sporamex Limited, to try and look at a variety of different taste masking options using their patented technology. So the diazocon is thought to be quite bitter. So we've been looking at different ways of trying to, to hide this taste and increase the palatability of the substance. So in year four, we've been looking at a number of different taste masking agents. And we found that compared to the blank diazocon, we had a, a, a better uptake, but it was still a lot lower than, than the blank hazelnut paste with, with nothing in it. So, we're seeing that the consumption is still below the target level of what we would like to see to get a full effect. But we have been seeing evidence of reduced cholesterol levels. And in the very short term, we did see a significant reduction of over 40%. So if we could try to um, improve the taste again, maybe look at different taste masking agents and other ways of delivering the diazocon, um, it's possible that this could still be a promising option. Um, but yeah, we, we need to try and improve the uptake to get a long-term effect. Now, the second option was developed in a collaboration with the University of Strathclyde. And this is using the immunocontraceptive vaccine formulation. Um, so the original protein was developed in conjunction with a French company called Osivax. Um, and then using the novel technology, the bilosomes from the University of Strathclyde, which is designed to protect the vaccine um, and the bilosomes act as a carrier to try and take it to the um, important areas in the gut system where it's taken up by the immune system. So there are a number of different benefits that we, we wanted to see with the bilosomes. And we tested three different variations of these bilosomes based vaccines. Um, we had some really, really good results in this where we had 100% of our treated rats showed an immune response to the vaccine, which was really great consistency. 
Um, we tested this in male rats and we looked at their testosterone pre and post treatment. And we did have lower testosterone levels in the short term in our treated rats as well. Um, however, if we're looking at the antibody target here, this is the target where we would likely begin to see in infertility in our treated animals. So we're just below what we would be hoping for. So with this one, we would need a bit more research to try and improve this immune response and reach the target that we'd be wanting to achieve infertility in these animals. So there are a number of different things that we could look at to try and add into these formulations to try and boost this immune response um, and, and yeah, get some better results. But yeah, we, we had a really good proof of concept in this one to start with. Now, our other candidate was again based on the same protein um, or vaccine, the immunocontraceptive. Um, but this was in partnership with the British company Spiromex. Um, they've got a novel, novel technology designed to um, protect the vaccine and increase the delivery through the, through the system. So these are empty pollen spores that you can load the vaccine onto. And um, yeah, a number, number of benefits, again, a little bit similar to the biolazone system. So we've been testing various formulations in partnership with Spormex to try and see if we can improve on some of the results we've had in the past. And I think I presented this a little bit while ago, but we had some really, really positive uh, results from the pilot study in this one. This was in the middle of year three where we had, again, we had 100% of our treated rats responded to the vaccine, which was fantastic. And we also had um, a really good result with the actual antibody levels, where we had in, especially in our most successful group, we had the majority of our animals were at or above the level that you would have expected to see in fertility in these animals. So what we did with this one is we tried to mix this one in with a free feeding bait. So in the pilot trial, this was given as a direct dose where you um, squirt it into their mouth. But we tried to mix this in with a free feeding formulation. And we found that when mixed in with the bait, as Giovanna was saying before, it's possible that the bait has um, an interference with the effect of the vaccine. So we repeated the test in squirrels and in rats, and we found the immune system wasn't stimulated when we mix it in with the bait. But it's very likely that we need to look at giving a higher dose level when they're delivered in a free feeding bait in order to achieve the antibody levels that we, we were after from the pilot results um, to get to that infertility level. Um, so yeah, mixing into a food does have an effect, but we, there's a few steps that we can take. So we've taken this forward into year four of the, of the project now, and we're looking at refining this vaccine formulation to see if we can achieve these levels in the bait. So we've just uh, we're just coming to the end of the trial at the moment, which is looking at a refined formulation. So we had a really fantastic response in this one where we had um, a 60 percent of our rats, which are three out of five, where we had a really high immune response. And this was it's proven that this was led to infertility in those animals as well. And we also had our results were very much linked to the antibody response, the actual response to the vaccine. So we had one of our animals which had a, a slightly lower response. She had a significantly reduced litter size. And then the animal with the least response, she was breeding normally. So these were some fantastic results. We were really excited about this one um, to get some infertility from an actual oral vaccine. And this was given as a direct dose. So what we've been doing as well is we delivered this as a high dose free feeding vaccine in a bait. Um, and this is our sort of really good news story at the moment where we've managed, I think is the first time that we have actually managed to achieve this, where we've got an immune response in our rats from a free feeding bait formulation, which is a fantastic step forward for the project. And we also managed to um, prove infertility from the injection ingestion of this bait formulation. So this is a fantastic result that we've managed to get very recently. Um, so the next steps here um, is we're going to want to explore a range of factors and um, to try and improve this consistency. Um, so again, we, we were talking about dose schedules. So this is done on a very strict schedule in the laboratory where we're giving six doses over a set amount of time. So what we want to look at is try and change this dosing schedule to see if we can match it to something that's a little bit more achievable in field effort. 
And we're also going to look at exploring different dose levels and different bait types to see if we can really improve on these results and reach at least 60% of the animals um, infertile. And then also look at the longevity of the effects that we've been seeing um, and hopefully increase infertility over the long term. Um, so yeah, we want to measure this effect. And then we also want to start moving into our target species, the squirrels. So all of this pilot result, results have been done in rats so far, but there's, there's really good results. We want to try and move forward into looking at squirrels and well and prove this effect um, crosses over the species. But yeah, this is our really good news story for today. So breaking news on the, on the webinar. Um, and as Giovanna was mentioning before, um, what we want to do is, I mean, it's a little bit, seems a bit counterintuitive when, you know, we're talking a lot about how we need to try and stop squirrels breeding. But in order to um, kind of prove the effects of a contraceptive, we've had to set up a captive squirrel breeding program. So for any contraceptive, we want to be using it first in a population of squirrels with a, a known reproductive potential, so a known reproductive status. So we've got our squirrels that we're, we're setting up here with, with known fertility levels. And we've been looking at a variety of different ways that we can actually measure the reproductive status of a squirrel. So it's actually a lot harder to get them to breed in captivity than you would expect, considering the problems that we've been having um, in the wild where, where they seem to be breeding really prolifically. So we're, we're looking at a combination of methods. We're looking at the actual breeding success, so physical breeding. We've been looking at a range of hormone cyclings, especially in females. And we've been looking at a range of breeding behaviours. So we've been using CCTV. Um, a lot of our staff have been um, diligently going through hours and hours of CCTV footage to look at our mating behaviours. Um, so yeah, that's we've had some really great success in this, um, and we found that 97% of our squirrel breeding groups have displayed measurable specific breeding behaviours. So all of these can be used to monitor the effect of a contraceptive. And obviously, these are happening twice a year, so we're continually building on our results and working on our individual squirrels and trying to get a complete package of data. So then when we identify our most successful oral contraceptive candidate, we can move to testing it in our captive squirrels and, and try to prove an infertility effect before we can move to our field trials as well. So there we go. Um, so I think we're about at the midpoint of year four at the moment. So at this stage, we've shown that we can effectively measure the reproductive status in our captive animals to prove contraceptive effect. We've done a really good proof of concept for three different contraceptive candidates that could be used in gray squirrels. We've identified the two strongest, which were the diazocon formulation and the specs based vaccine working with Sporomex um, that we can test throughout year four. And throughout the start of year four, we've managed to achieve a contraceptive effect from a baited vaccine dose. And then we've begun trials as well to try and refine this formulation and hopefully maximize its effect to reach our 60% level. Um, finally, I'd just like to thank a really big thank you to our collaborators and all the staff involved on working on the project. And thank you for listening. Thank you ever so much, Bex. <coughs> That was great. Um, Sarah, are you happy yeah. to go next? Let's see. Okay. Yep. Hang on a sec. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, so as Giovanna mentioned, uh, I'm going to be talking about the research we've been doing recently in developing a oral contraceptive delivery system, which is both effective and also species specific, so gray school specific. So this research has been centered around uh, three main questions. Uh, so will the majority of gray schools eat a bait containing contraceptives? Can we ensure contraceptives will not affect other animals? And also can we estimate gray school numbers and the effort required for a successful contraceptive delivery? 
So if we look at our first question, the way we've measured bait uptake so far is we've delivered a bait containing a bait marker to squirrels via bait hoppers for four days. So the bait hopper setup is shown on the left and on the right is a hair sample from a squirrel that's actually eaten the bait marker. So the bait marker is incorporated into the hair, it's a dye, and it causes the hair to fluoresce under UV light. So when we hair sample the squirrels, we can then see who's taken the bait and who hasn't. So then we trap the squirrels, the majority of squirrels in the wood, we sample their hair, and we can see what percentage of the squirrels in that wood has actually taken the bait. So these are our results so far. Uh, so the majority of schools in most woods will consume bait from hoppers in just four days. So you can see we have 10 woods, uh, a coloured bar for each wood. And, we see, and we've done this research in both winter and summer to look at seasonal effects and at two different densities of hoppers. So we can see in summer and with three hoppers per hectare, we've actually managed to achieve uh, over 70% bait uptake in a school population. So this is obviously really encouraging in terms of being able to deliver a contraceptive out in the wild. Um, also, if you see the number of schools per hectare, so the density of schools in each wood does have an effect of this on the bait uptake. So we see the bait uptake is generally better at lower densities of squirrels. Now there's one wood where we didn't get such good bait uptake results uh, shown in yellow. Uh, this was in 2020, and we believe this is because we made uh, minor modifications to the hoppers, and this may have uh, deterred the squirrels from using them. So in summer 2021, we decided to um, test whether improvements to the hoppers improved bait uptake, uh, but also we wanted to assess bait uptake in a, a one part of a larger wood. So up until now, We've done the research in fairly isolated woods, in smaller woods. So we wanted to look at more of a um, realistic scenario. So if you couldn't put hoppers across a whole wood and you just put them in a small section, what impact would that have on the wider wood and what kind of bait uptake would you get? In addition, we wanted to demonstrate how these methods could be transferred uh, to practitioners and volunteer groups as if we're going to roll out a contraceptive delivery program on a landscape scale, we're going to really rely on these type of people to deliver it uh, wide scale. So this work was primarily done by volunteers, trained by, by APHA staff and also managed by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. So uh, to deliver the bait, we put out 21 hoppers in the seven hectare midsection of the wood. In each hopper, we put 40 grams of hazelnut paste with a bait marker each day for four days. And we found that all of the hoppers had at least 20 grams of bait taken. And in fact, 90% of the bait that we deployed was consumed by squirrels. Now this led to frustrated squirrels. Uh, so you can see this guy has gone in the hopper, found it's empty and decided to wreck it as a result. Um, another um, effect we saw was with uh, squirrels act acting very aggressive around the hoppers, like guarding them, resource guarding. <laughs> so you can see they see this as a very prized resource and this kind of explains why you need enough hoppers per squirrels so you don't get this kind of uh, resource guarding around the bait. So to look at the hair sample results, so this map shows the locations of 60 traps we put out, one to 60. Uh, so we put it out them out across the whole wood. Uh, we caught squirrels in 57 of the 60 traps. In the uh, red baited area where the hoppers were, we caught 74 squirrels and 59% of them had taken bait from the hoppers. Across the wider wood, we caught 208 squirrels and 28% of them had consumed the bait. 
But what was really interesting is if you see the yellow traps, the yellow co colored traps are where we actually caught uh, squirrels that had taken the bait and tested positive for the bait marker. And you can see that the contraceptive, uh, a potential contraceptive delivery would be fairly targeted as with this bait marker, you can see that squirrels only made short range movements within the four weeks of the study. And the furthest distance between a positive trapped squirrel and the nearest topper was only 180 meters. So if you wanted to deliver a contraceptive across the whole of a wood such as this, you would probably need a small cluster around the bottom, a small cluster of hoppers up at the top, and then a central cluster to ensure that you've managed to cover the whole of the wood. Uh, so going on to the next question, uh, can we prevent other animals from accessing the contraceptive, uh, a contraceptive bait? So in all of our hopper trials so far with the bait marker, we found that a 70 gram weighted door and a metal outer case has kept out all of the species of UK wildlife. So these trials so far have been done in both Yorkshire and North Wales and in grey school only woodlands. Uh, there is a small caveat, so on two occasions, uh, we did actually find that two enterprising mice managed to actually get in and feed from the bait. However, this is out of thousands and thousands of occasions where grey squirrels went into the hoppers, so we don't see this as a significant issue. But in 2021, we wanted to test methods of keeping out red squirrels from the hoppers. So this would a bit allow us to put hoppers in areas where there's both types of squirrels to increase their application in red squirrel conservation. So we looked at various methods and how, how we could keep out red squirrels. So the first most simplistic and cheapest method was just to add extra weights onto the doors. So we tested up to 240 grams on the doors of the hoppers in two woods up in Northumberland uh, again, delivered by volunteers. And we tested whether red squirrels were able to access the bait. So uh, we got uh, monitored with trail cameras. We uh, recorded 21,000 photos of, and videos of animals in and around the hoppers. And they showed us that indeed red squirrels were able to access the bait through the heavier doors. The only other animal that was able to access the bait as well were stoats on a very small number of occasions. So on five occasions, they were recorded taking bait from the hoppers. So from this research, we decided that uh, heavy weighted doors probably weren't the way to go, as if we increase the weight much further, it's likely to deter gray squirrels as well as reds. Uh, so we looked at other alternatives. So as part of the same study, we uh, looked at uh, gathering colour sensor data. So the hoppers uh, in each wood also had colour sensors attached. And they recorded hundreds of visits by red squirrels and recorded the colour of their coat. So from this data, we saw that there was a lot of variation in the colour readings, even from individual squirrels. And this was due to the ambient light uh, at different times of day and also the different positionings of the animal within the hoppers. So we decided this, uh, the data was uh, a little more complex than we initially anticipated and that the method may need a little further refining. So we may need to increase the light intake of the hopper by, for example, using a perspex lid or a mesh lid uh, so the colour data was a little bit more accurate. However, we've just recently completed a trial uh, gathering grey colour coat data in local woodlands. So we're going to uh, compare the grey colour um, with the red colour to see if the, there's a detectable difference between the two. And if there is, then you could presumably use a, a specific colour in order to open uh, the hopper door. So you would need some kind of electronic system and sensor. Um, I should say also this is uh, a very good uh, method for use with other non-targets as well, as grey squirrels have a unique coat colour um, amongst UK wildlife. So this could also work for excluding other non-targets such as uh, pine martens, 
um, and anything that isn't basically gray. So the final method we've looked at so far is using body weight. Uh, so in winter 2021, we deployed automatic weighing platforms into woods up in Northumberland to record the weights of red squirrels. So a red squirrel is smaller than a gray squirrel, uh, but we didn't know how much overlap there was between the two body weights. Um, and if there is, uh, there is sufficient gap between the body weights, then that could be used to select for gray schools over red schools in hoppers. So in these two words, we estimate there was between 20 and 30 red schools and their body weights were recorded at between 200 and 415 grams. So you see the red school on the platform there. So there's a weighing platform attached to a feeder. So this was designed and produced by a red school practitioner, Barry Bickerton up in Northumberland. And we put these out and recorded as many weights as possible. So when we compared these red school weights to 50 gray school weights from the same time of year, we found that they were between 422 and 760 grams. And only two of those schools actually fell be below 450 grams. So we decided to test would a 450 gram weight, minimum weight to open the hopper door be sufficient to exclude all red schools by, but whilst allowing access by most gray schools. So this is just uh, to demonstrate how this system could work. So this is just a modified trap. If you can imagine this as a hopper entrance, there's a weighted platform um, electronically attached to a, a trigger. And this trigger could open, unlock a door. So you see the red school goes on the platform, red light shows no access to the contraceptive. Whilst if we now look at a gray school using this device, and again, the gray school goes in, it weighs, it's weighed by the platform and a green light comes on, a door would open and it can access the contraceptive bait. So we need to gather more data on gray school body weights versus red school body weights to ensure that there's enough of a difference between the two. But this looks probably like the most promising way of selecting between them. And in addition, this again would be good for non-target species, other non-target species, as uh, non-targets such as pine martins are much larger than gray squirrels, so you could have a weight range over which you would open the door. So the final question I've been looking at is, can we estimate uh, density of schools in order to inform uh, the level of successful management required? So we've deployed re remote cameras in woods, uh, and baited them for four days. And we calculate an index of the density of schools in each wood based on the number of school photos per camera per day. And this data is actually compared to uh, whole populations that have been removed from woods as a way of validating the method. So we found that there's a, from the 11 woods we've done the bait marker study, we also did the population study as well. And we found that there's a very strong relationship between the camera index as shown along the bottom of the graph and the density of schools that were subsequently removed from each wood. And this relationship is strong from low densities of two schools per hectare up to 10 schools per hectare. And if we look at the results from our 2021 study, we can use the graph to actually predict at, to an accurate level how many schools were in each part of the wood. So we trapped 74 schools and the index predicted they would be 62. Whilst in the whole wood, we trapped 208 schools and the index predicted they would be 189. Now, as these results uh, are so accurate, we've actually now developed this as a tool for practitioners to use. So we'll be shortly publishing it so uh, people can use it to measure school densities in their woods. 
So looking at our final key questions, um, will the majority of schools eat a bait containing contraceptives? So you can say, yes, they will, uh, even within highly connected sections of larger woods. Can we ensure contraceptives will not affect other animals? So from the research we've done so far, we can say it is highly likely that we can prevent red squirrels and other animals from accessing a contraceptive. And finally, can we estimate gray squirrel numbers and the effort required for successful contraceptive delivery? So yes, we can reliably measure densities of squirrels in woodlands at medium to high densities. So we look, if we look at the future work that we're doing um, in the short term, we want to test bait uptake with two hoppers per hectare to see if this is a more cost effective solution uh, for bait delivery. And also we'd like to, we're currently actually testing a longer bait deployment. So we're putting out the bait marker for two weeks to see if that significant, significantly increases the proportion of schools taking bait from hoppers. And we're also currently uh, assessing individual bait uptake and the amount of bait taken per visit. Uh, so we've microchipped 86 schools in two woodlands and we've been recording their feeding visits to hoppers and also how much bait they take per visit. So this will tell us how much of a contraceptive dose each individual within a population is likely to receive. Um, in, in terms of the species specificity, so uh, we're currently analyzing the data on the gray school coat color to compare with the reds to see if there's a significant difference. And we are currently gathering more data on red school body weights in different areas and seasons. So school body weight is uh, quite seasonal, they're heavier in winter than summer. And also they could vary across regions. So we want to gather as much data as possible to ensure that we can use this as a selective tool. And finally, we want to test the camera index method at low densities of squirrels and also in other seasons. So, so far we've been able to do it successfully in summer, but we want to also try and develop the method for winter as well. We're also interested in testing the method to see if it can be used in red school populations for red school conservation. So red school densities are typically much lower than gray schools. Uh, so we need to see if the method can be adapted for those purposes. So I'd just like to thank the UK School Accord and DEFRA, all of our collaborators, the landowners and volunteers that have con contributed to the study, and I'd just like to thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Okay. Thank you. Simon. Is Simon still there? <laughs> Yep, I'm, yeah, I'm here. Hey, Simon. <laughs> I didn't imagine you were. <laughs> no, no, I haven't wandered off just yet. <laughs> Great, right. thanks, Simon. Thank you, Kay. Um, so, yes, I'm going to... I've lost my video, so I can't see myself anymore, but um, I'll try and look presentable. Um, apologies. So yeah, this I, I'm going to um, give a brief update on the uh, on the modelling side of the project. Um, I'll apologise in advance. Some of you may have seen uh, this before, but I'll I'll give um, a reasonably brief recap on um, the results, what we've done so far, and the results, um, and then um, go on to what what we're hoping to do next. Um, so I suppose the first question is why why are we doing modeling what what is its purpose um and particularly some of you might wonder why we're doing it before we have a contraceptive available um there's two main reasons um for this really it serves two purposes the first is um for preparedness um so the modeling allows us obviously to combine all the information that we have um and to make some predictions in order to try and understand how we might roll out a contraceptive once it's available um, which means that as soon as it is, of course, we're, we're hopefully able to, um, to get going straight away. Um, and then the second is, is really for feedback. Um, so in building this framework, it, it helps. That's helpful. Uh, it helps us to identify the things that we don't already know. Um, and also to, in, in building the strategy, look at the kind of um, limits 
that we need in order to be successful. And this can feed back into the other areas to guide their development. So a little bit about the model. Um, so our, our main aim really has always been um, to provide as, as close to a real world tool as, as possible. And, and also to um, both Bex and Sarah have talked about um, some of the constraints uh, or some of the factors involved in the, in the contraceptive, such as dosing and uptake from squirrels. Um, so really we want to be able to, sorry, I set this presentation up and it, it appears to be, uh, it appears to be timed. So <laughs> I'll have to click back every now and again, um, is to, so for that, we, we wanted to be able to track the individual movements of squirrels. Um, so we chose to, to develop a spatially explicit individual based model, which um, really is exactly what it sounds like. Um, we define um, explicitly patches in, the land, in a landscape um, where, where squirrels, we expect squirrels to be found, um, and then model, seek to model the life histories of the individual squirrels as they, um, as they live, they reproduce, they move around, and then um, naturally they'll die. And on top of this, we can then build our mechanisms for, for different management to make comparisons. Um, so I'll skip straight on to um, some of our first results. So th this is based on um, the initial data we got from our year one study in the field. So that showed that for um, a fixed amount of uh, density of hoppers, uh, three per hectare put out for four days, we would expect to be able to um, target 79% of squirrels in, in a woodland. Um, and we wanted, therefore, then to, to take this data and to compare and to look at different um, uh, how, how different um, rate efficacies from then the contraceptive, once, contra once a squirrel had consumed bait, um, would compare to um, culling with a similar density of, of traps. Um, and so we, we set up our experiments, and these can be seen in the in the graphs here. Which what, what we saw was that even with a seventy five percent effective contraceptive, um, we were able to eradicate uh, a population in twenty five years. Now, comparing to to culling, which took roughly five five years to eradicate, um, we we were interested not just in the time that it took for the eradication to occur, but also the amount of effort. One of the benefits of fertility control against um, cage trapping is that um, traps you have to check once every day, um, whereas the hoppers or the feeders we're hoping um, will be able to be checked only once a week. So that means potential for five times less um, effort in terms of labor. So actually across making the comparison then um, between five years for eradication using culling and 25 years for um, fertility control obviously meant that actually these would be completed with equal effort according to that assumption. Um, taking then the fact that only 79% of our squirrels had to consume bait with a 75% um, drug related to 60% um, then squirrels becoming infertile in the field. Um, so this, this was an, an, an important limit that, or threshold that we, we then could take forward to look for as a minimum target for contraception if we wanted to, to be able to um, deliver the con uh, oral contraception um, in, in a, with it, the same effort as culling. So obviously I mentioned um, that this was based on, um, those previous results were based on a fixed number of traps uh, or, or hoppers. Um, what we wanted to understand next was um, what would happen if we were to vary the density. So could we, could we potentially reduce densities of hoppers or, or would they need to be increased and how that would change um, the uptake? Um, <clears throat> and obviously we wanted to also be able to compare the, uh, do the same for traps. So from field work in year two, and this, this, this was a study that Sarah conducted, um, we looked at the um, efficacy, so the number of um, traps uh, capturing squirrels per day against squirrel population. Um, and you can, you can see that in the figure, it keeps disappearing. Um, the relationship between those two, two factors. 
Um, and from this, we were able to determine um, an estimate of um, the probability of squirrels interacting with a specific trap on any given day um, and recreate uh, a pattern which looked very similar to this. This, of course, then allowed us to vary the um, number of traps in the field and hopefully be able to estimate exactly what the, eff the efficacy at a population level would look like. Um, you might notice towards the bottom of the, towards the right-hand side of the graph, there is a slight deviation in the, um, the solid line showing the observed data and the dots showing the modeled predictions. Um, this is largely, um, part of this at least, is because as you start to get to small numbers in the population, obviously you, it's a discrete process. You, you can't have parts of a squirrel in a trap necessarily. Um, and so you, you, that, that accounts at least for a little bit of um, the deviation. Another part of this might be down to aversion, but we haven't, we haven't necessarily um, tested this. But by and large, certainly at higher numbers, this, this relationship works very well. Um, as I mentioned, we also wanted to understand the same um, kind of process for feeders or hoppers about how individual squirrels interact and therefore then how changing density might uh, affect the, the overall efficacy of consumption. Um, so by and large, these followed quite similar um, patterns as the, as the hoppers, uh, sorry, as the, as the traps. Um, but what we noticed was, um, and Sarah's, Sarah's mentioned this, uh, it was a um, resource, uh, a conflicts for the resource effectively, which seemed to be related to the, the number of um, squirrels per feeder. So because unlike trapping, we're not removing squirrels from the population, um, these competitive effects were slightly were more pronounced. And so we added an adjustment um, to account for this based on the, the ratio of squirrels per feeder. And that's, that's what's shown in the graph here. So the, uh, the blue dots are from the field trials um, and then the orange dots are our um, predictions for this adjustment. So obviously what you see is that as, as there are more squirrels per feeder, the maximum proportion um, of squirrels that you can target in the population reduces. Um, so building all this into our model, um, we then ran some new um, simulations. Firstly, we looked at varying um, the density of traps in the field, um, trying to follow um, recommended guidance in terms of deployment across a year. Um, and you might not be surprised at the results. So um, assuming trapping in all woodlands across our extent with the same, the same density in every woodland, we saw very rapid reductions in population. Um, but interestingly, what we saw, um, so even, even with uh, trapping at um, one trap every eight hectares, we still, we still achieved eradication in about five years. Um, but what we did see was quite long, long tails to achieve that eradication. So actually, um, in order to guarantee eradication um, within a reasonable period of time, um, it, we actually required about um, one, one trap every two hectares, um, which is quite interesting, actually. So that, that achieved eradication within 10 to 15 years. Um, from what I've read, the, that density of traps as an average is, is roughly what was deployed um, across Anglesey. Um, and, and eradication, I think, um, was, was reported as, as being achieved within 13 years. So it's, it's actually very close to those, to those results. Um, what we then wanted to do, obviously, was to compare the fertility control. Um, so we, we used the same deployment as traps to um, allow our comparison again in terms of effort. So the, the idea that um, the effort in terms of labour to deploy hoppers would be five times less than um, to deploy traps at the same density. Um, so we deployed at um, this 0.5 feeders per hectare. Um, across the similar scale to Anglesey. Um, and naturally, we would expect, uh, and we did see slower population reduction. That's not to say that we didn't see reductions. And actually, you can see if we had, um, if every squirrel that consumed bait um, became infertile, then actually we did um, achieve quite significant reductions in the population, which is great. 
Um, however, within our 50 year period, um, which then compared to our trapping, we found that um, there was little to no chance of eradication. So at least at this feeder density, um, and, and obviously because of the relative maintenance costs, it would be possible to um, increase densities without necessarily exceeding cost against trapping at 0.5 um, traps per hectare, um, then it, it, wasn't it, it wasn't necessarily a cost-effective um, solution. But that's not to say it couldn't be. What we wanted to try next is, is at the best of both worlds, really, combining culling, um, short-term culling, but with um, reasonably high effort, uh, followed then by fertility control um, in lower density populations where we, we knew that competition potentially would be, would be lower and we would be able to target more individuals. Um, and again, this, this saw the rapid population reduction that we saw with, with culling. Um, but this time um, with the fertility control afterwards, um, we were able to er achieve eradication in similar, similar time um, to culling and actually um, we with a again with a contraceptive with only 75 percent efficacy um, we were able to achieve um, eradication in similar time to culling um, so that's in terms of time obviously um, again because of the um, the comparisons we make in terms of labor therefore this combined approach could in fact be um, quite significantly more cost effective um, than um, than culling on its own. Um, <clears throat> so I'll skip forward. So in terms of what we're doing next, um, we've always been trying to move towards a more practical tool to inform management at various scales, both regional uh, and local. Um, one of the, the downsides of the, the modelling that we've done to now is it's been quite broad in terms of its space and time. So I mentioned that when we've considered simulations, um, we've considered um, trapping and contraceptive deployment across the entire extent of our map, so in all woodlands at the same time. Um, and we've also had an annual time step. Um, so it's been quite difficult to be able to um, pick out some of the effects that we might expect to see within a year. So one of the things we've been doing is to reduce the time step um, from an annual one to weekly which means that we can better capture um, the, the potential for, for squirrel movements um, between woodlands if they're not necessarily controlled at the same time. Um, and also to look at um, more realistic management schedules along the lines of what actually might be deployed in the field. So for instance, um, trapping in one week each month for nine months, rather than um, for uh, the, the number of days concurrently. Um, and we've also introduced a finer, finer scale um, in, in terms of our management parcel, which now allows us to be able to um, simulate um, different, uh, the more patchy nature or potential for more patchy nature across the landscape in terms of management. So those are shown in the figures at the bottom there. So on the, on the left hand side, um, what we've done is we've split up every woodland into the UK, in the UK, into small 20 hectare parcels, reasonably even. 20 hectare parcels, which we can now then um, set, uh, define in our model and give a particular schedule for either trapping um, or hopper deployment. Um, so the exact week in which traps are put out or hoppers are put out and the relative densities with which they're, they're put in. Um, <clears throat> and we've also defined then separated out the differences between um, whether we consider the, the, uh, that patch to be rural or urban, which potentially will become important um, when we start to look at um, differences in, in management and what, what might be possible. Um, as well, on top of these, um, one of the comments that we've, we've often had back from reviewers of the modeling work is um, what is the impact of um, masting seed production? Um, there's obviously a lot of information and a lot of evidence that squirrel populations are, are very dependent on seed production. Um, and therefore it's, it's important that we, we consider that, uh, the possibility that that might impact on our, our recommendations. So we've also been looking at that aspect of things. And that's, that's where we've, we've got some preliminary results already. 
Um, so what we've what we've done is we've created a, a landscape again, uh, looking at the real world. We've attempted it is an abstract one, um, but we've attempted as best as possible to benchmark it in in the real world by um, looking at taking different resources to identify a particular tree species uh, and looking to build in the different um, frequencies and patterns we would expect to see with um, the different uh, different masting patterns for, the, for those species. Um, and we've, we've then compared that to our uh, completely fixed landscape, which is what we've had previously, um, based on a, a mean density. All this affects our carrying capacity and therefore then how the, how the populations, the squirrel populations behave and potentially bounce back um, when we look at our, our different control measures. Um, and in the figures, um, so you can see we've we've tried we've compared four different um, management practices in, in both the fixed and the variable landscapes. So no uh, no management at all, um, trapping, um, contraception with a, a perfect contraceptive, the same um, hopper density as trap density, and then again our sequential integrated approach. Um, and as you might expect in the variable landscape. Obviously, if we're comparing the, the absolute population, the absolute numbers, then um, we do see um, some peaks and some troughs, some variation where, um, where our squirrels are going up and down. But actually, if we look at the relative differences um, between uh, our control measures, actually comparing against fixed, we see that the, each control measure um, roughly behaves the same relative to another. Um, which is really good news because that, that potentially suggests that at, while obviously masting has an effect on our absolute numbers, it, it potentially doesn't have any impact on our, on our general recommendations about which method might be better um, and, and allows us potentially to, to simplify. So where are we going next? Um, well, really, um, the purpose of our, our developments and, and our changes to the model have been building up to looking at um, coordinated control. Um, so really it's important for us to, to start to, to look at and be able to represent what the current situation is in terms of management and then how that could or how that will be modified um, and adapted you, with once the oral contraceptive is available in order to um, produce uh, the, the results we're looking at both at regional and local scale. Um, so by and large, a lot of the questions that we're asking are, are, are very similar to what, what they are before. So the main difference is that now um, we're able to look at more detailed solutions, um, taking into account more bespoke situations um, and, and hopefully um, to, to get closer to a best strategy um, to achieve any management goal that we might be interested in. <clears throat> So uh, that's all from me, or at least at least until we have questions. So I'll, I'll hand back over to uh, to Giovanna. But thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Simon. And Giovanna will just wrap it up. <laughs> so hello again. And I would like to share some conclusions now on all the three talks you um, heard. So in terms of developing oral contraceptives, as you have heard, we tested two candidates, oral contraceptive or gray squirrels. We decided that diazocone as a cholesterol inhibitor needs more R&D. We cannot take everything forward. So we decided to focus on the GnRH-based vaccine as we have had significant progress. Um, and that's why we are now testing those frequency and bait composition in rats and then in captive squirrels. I would like to add to this that I also have a job as Europe Director of the Botstiber Institute for Wildlife Fertility Control. The reason I'm mentioning this is that I am personally in touch and, and hence the team is in touch with all the groups worldwide 
that are working on research on oral contraceptives for rodents or for other species too. And this is important because we will get to know a number of developments much sooner than um, others because we will hear before they are made publicly available um, by being in touch with different groups. If something came along tomorrow that we felt was much more advanced than what we are doing now, we would be very keen to explore that, that route too. And that's why we have already taken some um, steps to talk to potential collaborators in, in this area. That doesn't mean that we will not take forward what we have developed so far, but again, we could follow parallel lines and, so to speak, not to put all our eggs in the same basket, in one basket. For the um, side, for the research concerning the field work, you have heard that we now know that most squirrels ingest contraceptives if there are enough feeders per squirrel. And generally, uh, most of our tests have been done putting out the bait that will contain the contraceptive for four days in a week. So we are pretty sure that we could also improve in terms of proportion of animals that will ingest the contraceptive. We also know that individual squirrels feed multiple times per day from feeders, and we will use these two uh, lines of information to optimize bait uptake and to put out in the field something that will make sense given the proportion of squirrels that eat the bait and the individual amount of bait eaten per squirrel per day on average. Uh, we were delighted uh, when Sarah told us that non-target species really can access feeders. I'm sure we can tolerate a few animals that will do it, but this was a great result. Um, and also, as you heard, we are working on, we are exploring or exploiting body weight of red and gray squirrels to prevent access to bait. I've noticed that there are some questions in, in the chat and we'll answer them later. The, the last part I would like to add is a bonus. The, the measuring densities of squirrels. We did not set up to, we didn't plan to measure densities of squirrels because it was not part of the project, but we quickly realized that we needed a valid method or a reliable method to uh, measure densities because that's the only way we can measure the impact of intervention. And so we now know that we can reliably measure these densities to deploy sufficient feeders and to assess the impact of population control, which could be culling or and fertility control on squirrel numbers. We, so we have completed the trials of the vaccines. We will, sorry, in the future, no, we have, we are in the process uh, by year five to complete trials of vaccines in rats and then start the vaccines in squirrels, in our captive squirrels. We are combining the two lines of research from field and lab data, and also with the third line of the model to optimize bait uptake and to plan how um, bait delivery will happen in the field. We have been lucky to work with a lot of practitioners and groups that we have trained in using the camera trap index. And this is important because this index can assess the effort or individual groups can assess the effort required to use fertility control in a wood, but also they can monitor the impact of using fertility control or culling on the number of squirrels. We, as you have heard from Simon, we have built and we are still building a model for practical applications. Um, and in particular, we are thinking about coordinated control. I'll go back to it in a second. And we have made significant progress in discussions about contraceptive registration dossier. So we have initiated talks with both APHA's business unit and with a company that specializes in regulatory advice for product development. This include preparation of technical and supporting document to the required specifications 
and submission to the authorities, as well as application for clinical studies and advice on best route to market. Both APHA and this company have expertise in identification of partners to outsource the drug development process. In the long term, uh, but we have started this already, we need to think about the social acceptance of fertility control and how this will be rolled out in practice. So the UK Squirrel Accord and APHA outside the current projects are collaborating with the DEFRA Behavioral Insight Team uh, to put out some signs that will explain, uh, that will be placed in the future next to the feeder and will explain what we're doing. And the signs or the messages have been um, prepared with different stakeholders in mind. So we, for instance, with stakeholders that value conservation or that value the impact, or they, they are worried about the impact of squirrels on timber or that value the welfare of animals and so on. So we would like to tailor these messages to uh, the different stakeholders to see what will work best in different scenarios and for different stakeholders. And we're very lucky to have the DEFRA Behavioral Insight team with us because they are doing this, um, they're, they're very excited about this part of the project because it's unusual for them to work on um, fertility control and wildlife. We need to look at the cost and the feasibility compared with alternatives, always with any method, this is what we, we need to do. But we also, as Simon was mentioning, need to start looking at the landscape trials Coordinated control will be key. Whether the squirrels are living in rural or urban areas, convincing your neighbors that fertility control is a good idea will be key to the success of this method at landscape scale. And finally, uh, in terms of testing for registration, we have already started to collect data on the manufacturing on the safety, on the efficacy, and on the environmental impact. We will need to do more. For instance, uh, if you register a drug, you have to prove that uh, the potential effects on the environment, including on scavengers and predators of, in this case, squirrels. And that will have to be done to put together the registration dossier. So once again, I would like to extend my thanks to the UK Squirrel Accord and to DEFRA for funding the project. Also to all our collaborators, landowners, volunteers, community group that join us, private individuals that wrote letters following the media coverage saying, I want to take part to the project, tell me what I need to do, and I'd love to, to be part of it. We, we could not have done it without you, and we are very, very grateful and excited about this. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Giovanna. And I think if everyone can just turn their cameras on, um, they, that was all amazing and you are all amazing in this work. Is that a, just a very exciting point? And, and, and um, I'm just so, so I'm sure along with a lot of other people, it'll be just really wonderful to see how this progresses over the next few years. Um, we have had quite a few questions come in. Um, some of the questions that were sent in beforehand there are quite a few on pine the issue of pine martins um, um and we recognize that pine martins can be part of the solution but um this webinar isn't set up to talk about pine martins but we do have an online conference that i'm organizing during red squirrel awareness week where we will look at pine martins as part of that and that'll be on the 22nd and 23rd of september um so uh, i'll start promoting that next week. Um, so we'll try and cover some of those questions, hopefully, uh, during that time. Um, uh, I also want to just say thank you to lots of people who are offering land and resources, Giovanna said, for the landscape scale field trials. Um, these will need to be coordinated and collaborative and well-funded, um, and we will be considering these, but they are in development. So just a massive thank you to everyone that has done that. Um, Going on to some of the questions, I know the team has been answering some of them, but it's good to actually kind of pick them out and, and answer them online. 
Um, so what quantity of feed or formula would a squirrel need to eat to ensure the contraceptive is effective and how long does it remain effective once consumed? Bex. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I'll take that one. Um, so at the moment, um, as Sarah mentioned, what we're going to be looking at is individual patents of bait uptake. So we've got a device that can weigh the amount of bait that an individual squirrel will take in the field each time it visits the hopper. So the idea is once we've completed that trial would be to marry the two sides of the project where we know an achievable uh, feeding rate for a squirrel in the wild. And we can try to refine and tailor the dose that's needed for the contraceptive to be effective um, into something that is actually achievable in the wild. So yeah, it'll be a sort of a, a combination of both sides of the project coming together. So we know that from the specific behavior of squirrels, they will take the amount of contraceptive needed. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically that one. Great, thanks very much, Bex. Um, this is one for Sarah. Were any raptors nesting in the area where field tests were conducted and did they affect gray squirrel behavior, um, i.e. did they avoid a zone around the raptor nests? Um, yeah, so we've uh, done uh, a lot of field trials in areas where there's um, buzzard nests and uh, uh, tawny owl holes. Um, so we've not seen any uh, evidence that affects the squirrel behavior. In fact, we've had squirrels feeding from hoppers directly underneath buzzard nest so so much so that we've had the buzzard feces around the hopper <laughs> and they're still still using it so they don't seem to be that bothered about the uh, the, the, the locations of the nests great thanks very much uh, Sarah uh, presumably uh, this is from George Browning presumably in the areas like us in the West Midlands where there are no red squirrels it would be possible even desirable to lower the minimum weight to make to be sure to catch all the greys until the required level of control preferably elimination is achieved. <laughs> um, so yeah so as I mentioned uh, in areas where we don't have uh, red squirrels as non-targets then we could probably use a much more basic design that doesn't require body weight so we could just use the weighted door and that would allow all squirrels to uh, all grey squirrels to enter the hoppers and feed from a contraceptive. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, someone asked, what about the black grey squirrel populations, um, uh, which they do have uh, in Cambridge? Uh, I know there's albino and melanistic forms of both red and grey squirrels. Um, so as far as I'm aware, I think most of those melanistic forms are, are located down south. And obviously these are, these are grey squirrel only areas. So we wouldn't need to use a sophisticated system like a colour sensor to actually allow the grace to go in. We could just, just use the basic weighted door in that circumstance. Thanks, Sarah. Um, what is the estimated cost of a feeder or hopper to administer the contraceptive? Um, so our research tool is fairly expensive um, as it has microchip readers attached, colour sensors, all these kind of bells and whistles that you really wouldn't need if you were putting out a contraceptive in the field. Uh, so we would see envisage that the resulting feeder uh, that we choose the design of will be more robust and much, much cheaper. So we're looking at the kind of cost of an average squirrel trap, maybe, maybe slightly more if you need something more sophisticated, like a body weight system attached. Uh, great. And this is an interesting one. Uh, and the, I can kind of thought about the kind of pine marten scent issue as well, but um, they read somewhere that pine marten scent deters red squirrels from using bait stations or feeders, but doesn't deter grey squirrels. And could this be an extra tool to prevent red squirrels from taking the contraceptive? So could it be added as well as the weighted platform? Or the yeah, so I mean, anything like that could could help. Um, I mean, obviously, we don't want red squirrels really anywhere ne near the hoppers that the greys are using. So we would need a secure door initially uh, to, pr to be absolutely certain that the reds can't get in. But yeah, anything that could deter them could be potentially used because we don't want the risk of disease transmission as well. Uh, obviously, you'd need to disinfect the hoppers. Uh, regularly to ensure that they they don't uh, they're not a source of disease transmission. Um, but yeah, anything that can help keep the reds away that that would be great. Yeah, great. Thanks, Sarah. Because that is a question: is how is cross contamination of the virus between grey and reds to be managed on the feeders? But I think you've answered that. Yeah, yeah, please. yeah. Thank you, <laughs> uh, Simon. This is a question from you for you. Sorry, since the introduction of remote alert devices, trapping effort can now be much reduced for the same number of traps. 
what is it, the statement or the question, but. Sorry, I can't, uh, I can't see that question, Kay. Um, it's in the you question and answers and the answer bit. Sarah, you answered it about mm -hmm. using trap alert devices. Yeah, so that's the trap alert devices. Um, um, yeah, so it's, I, I guess it's about reducing trapping effort. Um, yeah. using remote alert devices so we've sorry I, if i can take this off simon because we, we've in the field we use trap alert devices we have used them and as pharma we've tried different methods using them uh, different types of trap alerts like vibration triggered ones i know more sophisticated ones are being designed which actually have cameras but as far as i'm aware aware they're not 100 yet so you still have to physically check the traps every day until they can guarantee that you wouldn't miss an animal in a trap best practice is still to check them every 24 hours at least uh yeah this this is definitely a question for simon <laughs> uh, what, okay. fre what frequency and magnitude of masting did si did you consider in your modeling uh, from the figure on the right it assumes infrequent masting is it grounded in evidence or another instance of roast into glasses no it's, it's based on a, a species like tree species specific um data from the uh, forestry company so i've i've, I've sent uh, an answer with some more details on that to this specific question already but um yeah, it's largely we took an approach which is um, similar to another study um, that was published, um, I think, either last year or the year before, um, looking at strongholds um, for for um, grey and red squirrels in in Scotland, um, <clears throat> and effectively we're taking um, or that that took um, masting or seed, seed production information in terms of frequency. Um, and, and the impact on um, squirrel population from the forestry, from data from the Forestry Commission. So it's, it's, the picture itself is, is, is actually arguably a little bit misleading. So I, I wanted to show that we do produce some variation in the variable landscape, um, but actually um, what, what I've produced there is an aggregation um, across lots of different simulations. So that the masting itself, um, we obviously, there's, there's limited information about exactly um the data we have every year so whether there's a mass year or not and for what species and, and for where so it's it's a kind of it's a randomized um representation and and what i've shown there is an aggregation across it all so i wouldn't take too much um stock in terms of the uh, the exact kind of where the peaks and troughs are only that it is including um the variability now and and the uh, that the it doesn't have uh, across all the situations we still see the same relative um, impacts and, and efficacies of the different management. Thanks very much Simon. <clears throat> um, does predation on grey squirrels have taken up the contraceptive pass through to the non-target predators, uh, pine martins, goshawks, stoats? I know this I know this has been kind of answered in the presentation but I think it's good to pick this out because it, I know it's a concern for a lot of people. Uh, yeah, I'll probably start off on that one. Um, I know a lot of people, uh, it's one of the questions that, that gets brought up quite a lot about the issue of predation. So um, if we're talking about the contraceptive vaccine, so the GnRH uh, hormone that it targets is mammal specific. So there would be no risk to any birds that would predate or access any gray squirrels um, that had anything to do with the vaccine. So that, that kind of rules out that side. For any mammal predators, at the moment, it's we're finding it very difficult to get it to work in squirrels. You need a very specified dose. It's really difficult to protect it through the acidic stomach environment. So once it is being digested, uh, all that's left is antibodies. So if it is being digested, um, there, there would not be an effect up the food chain. If an animal were to eat a squirrel that had immediately eat, uh, like you know, just after it accesses the, the bait hopper and it, it's still sitting in the stomach, there is the possibility of a, a cascade, but it's very, very unlikely. So at the moment, squirrels, with the formulation that we've got, they would need to take multiple doses over multiple occasions on kind of a, a specified schedule. So the, the likelihood of a larger predator getting the, the required amount of vaccine, it would have to be a, a lot more physical bait for a, a bigger animal as well, especially something like a, a fox or a pine martin, which are, which are bigger. Um, it would need to, to eat a lot of squirrels to get enough 
vaccine to be an effective dose. And especially if you're getting, um, you know, to, to be able to protect it through the gastric environment or in a squirrel, it, it would be really, really difficult for it to have an effect. But obviously, um, it, once we move to registration trials to, to get this registered as an actual product, that's one of the things that is required for the registration data would be a full and complete assessment of the, the, the predation and the, the risk and things like that of, of the trophic cascade and the environmental effects of the vaccine. So it's something we will be definitely looking at at, at really great detail at a later stage. Thanks very much. Did anyone else? Just want to. A bit of, I'm just going to mute you, Bex, because I think there's a bit of feedback from me. When <laughs> sorry, um, Giovanna, did you want to say anything on that as well? Or? No, I'm just uh, going to add what uh, Bex added at the end. So typically for these trials, after you have the formulation that you think is working perfectly for your species, then you give uh, your target animals either the dose or a much higher dose, and then kill these animals and feed them to potential predators uh, and then look at the possible effects on predators. But as Bex said, if it's a vaccine, it's very unlikely to affect predators, but that's one of the uh, registration requirements without which we couldn't register a drug. Thank you, Vanna. Um, is culling comparably effective to a hypothetical contraceptive and takes similar effort? Do contraceptives have the potential to be cheaper and take less effort? Uh, maybe before Simon uh, answered this, presumably this is a question for Simon, I would like to point out something that uh, listeners might know already, but uh, the, the paper and the report by Forest Research, where they asked 3,700 people which are the methods that you would prefer using uh, for controlling gray squirrels. And uh, the first method of choice was fertility control. So besides the, um, the cost and the feasibility, we should also consider the social acceptance, not, be, not for, for moral reasons, but because the, the more socially acceptable a method is, the more likely it is to be used. Thanks very much, Giovanna. <clears throat> uh, there's a question coming about the number of hoppers. The number of hoppers per hectare talked about seems to be considerable, but not sure if this is just at the research stage, but the cost of setting up and maintaining that quantity would be very expensive. Um, Sarah, do you want to answer that? Uh, yeah, and then, and then Simon can add to it if he yeah. wants yeah, to. And Simon, well. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, basically, uh, you do need a fairly high density of hoppers. Um, because as the research shown, if you have too low a density per squirrel, um, there's a certain amount of prevention by squirrels to other squirrels to accessing them. So um, we're trying to find the most cost effective method of deploying as much bait to squirrels as possible, like through clusters of hoppers. So you don't have to walk as far because at the moment we're doing the best case scenario in terms of delivery bait. So we spread the hoppers a, a, amongst the wider wood evenly spread um, and this has been very successful however we only need to deploy the hoppers for four days to hit 70 percent of the population so we've shown that so you don't need to put them out for very long you don't need to visit them every day so and you can move grids of hoppers around woods to <coughs> target certain areas of squirrels so um, the overall effort yes initially uh, is higher than traps, but in the long term is much, much lower. Yeah, because are we talking about putting them out for a short period for a couple of times a year? Well, we'll have to, that has to be know, decided yeah. with, the, the, with the lab stuff instead in, in case of dosing. But if you say dose them just before the peaks are breeding um, to ensure you have the biggest effect, then yeah, we would envisage that you'd only have to put the bait out for potentially a couple of weeks to hit most of the animals in a population. I don't know if Simon has anything more to add to that. But, uh, Is that a couple of weeks a year or a couple of weeks per breeding season? In terms of um, how often you do it per year, I think we're still working that out. I think at the moment we're basing it, we've done it in summer and winter, the trials, because we're looking at every possibly every six months we would hope we can get something to last at least 
part of the breeding season. Um, immediate, so you, you put it in immediately before the main peak in breeding in winter um, uh, to ensure that you have the biggest effect. Thanks, Sarah. Simon, um, did you want to uh, Yeah, all, all I was going to say was that um, if, if you're looking at fertility control alone, then, then yes, obviously we've, we've looked at quite high densities of, of hoppers. Um, a lot of it will depend on the, the amount of um, coordination across an area. Um, as Sarah said, um, what we've been comparing against is, is quite reasonably regular, um, albeit low density um, cage trapping. Or live trapping as a comparison um but only at the moment considering um you know uh, putting deploying the hoppers um once or twice a year so in theory while there might be um quite high densities in different areas those those hoppers could be shared and moved around um to to extend the the, the spatial scale at which they're they're able and reduce cost um what i was going to say um is just looking at our strategies obviously there's this um for the sequential approach. So if, if um, one of the recommendations or one of, one of the approaches that we're looking at is obviously to, to look at culling um, as, as, an initial, um, as an initial step to reduce populations. And, and at that point, um, once populations are lowered, um, the, the number of hoppers that you might need to subsequently keep populations low um, might be much lower than we've, we've looked at. Um, so far, purely because of the relationship um, between um, squirrels and, and numbers of hoppers. So obviously reducing the squirrels, um, you also reduce the squirrel to hopper ratio that you need in order to get a, a particular um, level of consumption as far as we've seen so far. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a work in progress and, and that is kind of the point of the, the, the model moving forward is to, is to look at addressing these questions in, in, in a more practical sense. Thanks very much, Simon. Yeah, the UK Squirrel Accord is, is working to finish up and then to publish the uh, England Red Squirrel Action Plan. And um, I know the Forest Commission working on a, reviewing and updating the Grey Squirrel Action Plan, but there are also action plans and strategies in all of the uh, other UK countries, uh, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And within that, what is highlighted a lot is this, uh, you know, the importance of collaborative and landscape scale activity, uh, which is, will be something that's important for the, you know, for the fertility control. And again, as Simon was saying, maybe the sharing of these hoppers. Um, Sarah, um, somebody pointed out that there is, um, Sorry, I'm just not naming names because I haven't asked a people if I can name them <laughs> on the webinar. So I'm just picking out questions. But um, um, they they have been um, catching grey squirrels that that 300 grams or less. And somebody suggested that this could possibly because they are non-breeding juveniles, so not necessarily a target for contraception. Uh, contraceptive. Yeah. Uh, so when we've done trapping, it has been typically at. Uh, two times of year, so uh, mid-summer, mid to late summer, and also in winter, as this are the peak times we would be looking at maybe deploying a contraceptive. So at these times of year, they, we've been seeing um, no squirrels below 400. Um, I, think, I think the lowest was 422. If they're, if they're 300, they will be juveniles and we're not really interested in targeting those individuals until they get a little bit bigger. And then hopefully then we will um, target them once they're a bit bigger. And also, again, this is related to if we deploy the feeders in areas where there's both type of school. If it's just a weighted door, then the chances are those 300 gram schools would still be able to access the contraceptive bait anyway. Uh, thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, Simon, uh, uh, this question, can you add to your modelling the effect of volunteer shooting to fixed feeder locations in a wood in conjunction with possible annual trapping? So in, in theory, um, it would be possible to add shooting in as a control method. Um, I suppose the part of the reason why we haven't done it so far is, is we found it quite difficult to gather data on, on the relative efforts. So for instance, um, you know, if, if you need information about both the, the population of squirrels that you're you're shooting um, in terms of density, the number of um, the number of shooters, the amount of time spent um, in order to kind of get 
uh, gauge an idea of the um, efficiency of it. Um, if anybody has access to that kind of data or collects it, then it'd be really interesting for us to look at that and, and to see um, about how we can, can turn it into a kind of a, a quantified representation for the, for the model to include it, certainly. Yeah, yeah that can I just add, yeah, so we have been in touch with several uh, school groups um, and they have provided us with shooting data. But finding the specific shooting data that we need, including uh, when they go out and can't shoot anything, um, not just numbers. And as Simon said, the initial squirrel density and the size of area you're looking at, it, it's really difficult to work out the efficacy of shooting. Um, I'm sure it is very efficient um, in, in, in certain circumstances and with certain shooters, but I think, um, yeah, we would like some more information on that because it's something that we can't easily replicate in a scientific study. Uh, we need people who are out there doing it. If I can add something to this that Sarah quickly alluded to, the, as an appeal to everybody that is listening and might help in this area, the importance of zeros, the importance of the time that somebody goes out to shoot, spends three hours in the field, comes back without any squirrel. Uh, typically, people will not tend to record this, but that is equally important because those three hours would have been spent towards it. And so it, that is why we insist on it. The, we, we call it the importance of zeros, which is crucial to assess the effort. Mm. And it's something I know the, the, the UK School of Code has been looking at with people is that, that, that um, uh, standardizing recording so that it's very easy to collect all of the data that's needed, but also for the, then the researchers to be able to utilize that data. And by standardizing the recording, it makes it much easier to collect what is needed um, yeah. and, and then for the analysis. Um, there is a question that says, realistically, how much of a total solution is the fertility program once it is in use? Um, how, how much of a total solution is the fertility control program once it is in use? And I think this leads back to the fact that this is part of the answer, that fertility control is part of the answer. I, I would say fertility control is one of the many tools. Mm. And, uh, and that's why I always say fertility control, we, we need to identify the, the species, in which case it's easy, is the gray squirrel, but also the contexts. We do know that if you try to cull animals in, in cities, and I know that um, some cities have done it, but that will be difficult because people will uh, oppose it. And so that's where fertility control might be the only solution, unless you change people's mind, which is not easy. That's great. Uh, thanks very much. Um... For Simon, the crucial quantity for the amount of bait with contraceptive taken up is not the mean, but rather the proportion of greys that take enough bait to become sterile. Those not taking enough will breed and their offspring will likely take the place of squirrels not born to sterilised individuals. Is that variance considered to date? Yes. Um, simple answer is no. <laughs> um, partially because we've, uh, we haven't yet got that, that data on the numbers of doses that are needed um, and therefore we haven't haven't implemented that in the model what we've assumed so far um, is that um, contraception or the will or the contraceptive will last for for a year um, obviously Sarah has been um, collecting data in the field so we do have um, individual level in information about interaction um, with hoppers, which we can examine to try and include kind of individual variations. I think I'm right in saying, but Sarah will correct me if, if I'm wrong, uh, I hope anyway, um, that, that actually um, in terms of interactions with hoppers, it's relatively um, binary in terms of either squirrels visit the hoppers quite frequently and therefore could get quite a lot of doses and, 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 and consume um, enough enough contraceptive in, in the short time we've put them out um, or they don't interact with the hoppers at all um, and we have included that in, in our models 
already. But yeah, it's certainly something we'll look at as we start to get more information about what's going to be required from the contraceptive. Uh, thanks very much, Simon. Um, this question, some urban and suburban areas contain large grey squirrel populations. Uh, they may be great potential for use of contraceptive control in urban and suburban areas. Should there be separate field modelling and social opinion studies in such areas? That is why, um, in fact, with the UK Squirrel Accord, we have started this other line of research that involves social scientists. Uh, exactly to, to answer that. What is the, the best message that we can put out in, a, in an honest way, explaining what we're doing, but so that the message touches the interest of different stakeholders to convince them that this could be a viable, viable uh, option. Um, can I just add something yeah. as well? So, so I guess um, our key aims of the project is to protect biodiversity, to protect tree health, and also obviously to protect the red squirrels. So in terms of targeting areas that are key for those purposes, um, you probably, we've not looked at urban areas at the moment because they're not those key areas. They are obviously contribute and we need to look at them. But in terms of the wider picture, we're looking at woodlands initially um, as our key target areas. Thanks, Sarah. Did anyone else want to just pick up on that at all? Or... No? Um, somebody asked about explaining more about the funding for this project. So, yeah, the UK Squirrel Accord <clears throat> has raised funding, as I mentioned, um, from the UK Squirrel Accord signatories, from other conservation and forestry sectors, uh, from private individuals and estates, and from the grant making uh, organisations. And we've We've funded part of it, but DEFRA has also been significant in, in, in funding, providing funding for it. Um, Giovanna, did you want to say a bit more about the DEFRA funded side of that aspect of it? Yes, so DEFRA is one of the signatories of the accord and the DEFRA contribution has been crucial because initially the uh, project was developing and delivering uh, oral contraceptives for squirrels and then DEFRA came along uh, supporting the research every year uh, with several tens of thousands of pounds per year to allow Simon to develop the model and also to allow us to collect more data on the field that were fed into the model. And there have been the reduced lab costs as well, as not it? Sorry? And reduced lab costs as well, so. Right, oh yes. So uh, the, the facilities at the lab that would be Pro prohibitive and pro prohibitively expensive <laughs> uh, are not costed in this project because DEFRA is part of it and we are a DEFRA agency. Great, thanks very much Giovanna. Yeah, thanks very much to everybody, everybody that's uh, donated. Um, uh, uh, somebody has a plausible timeline for deployment. Giovanna, what's just... So, um, as Bex was mentioning here, five will finish in January 24. By year five, we are really hoping to have a product that has been successfully tested in captive squirrels. At that point, we could start doing some pilot field trials in, in small woodlands. We always start small and then grow it from there. So that will be in, in a couple of years. Great, thanks very much, Giovanna. Uh, and there's been a question on the gene editing, uh, which I know isn't, but uh, which European Squirrel Initiative is uh, spearheading along um, with the Roslyn Institute isn't it, at the University of Ex Ex uh, Edinburgh, not Exeter, two different places in the country. Um, what do you think is the realistic possibility of being able to use gene editing and gene drive to control fertility in grey squirrels? And this is more a question for ESI, but it, gene editing is something that the Squirrel Accord is, you know, we will keep an eye on, um, as with anything and everything that could possibly offer a solution to the problem that we're trying to tackle. Um, it's in its very early infancy at the moment, I think. Um, it's, it's realistic to say. Um, and there is funding and a lot more research that needs to take place before um, uh, we could understand whether it be a realistic possibility. Is that right, Giovanna? Yes. Uh, so there's been a, the ninth International Conference on Fertility Control was uh, organized last May in Colorado. And in fact, myself, 
back Sarah and Simon, we all went there and we listened to several talks on gene editing, both of squirrels and or other rodents on islands. I think everybody recognizes that it's still early days, but as Kay was saying, we are keeping very much an open mind because we need absolutely every tool we, we can have. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much. I'm just checking. I think we've pretty much answered all of the questions. I know there's been some chat going on as well. Um, and I hope, you know, people are able to take some of this offline as well and, and, and catch up with either the team or each other. Um, so I just want to say a massive thank you. And I just want, actually, does anybody from the team want to just say a final few words um, before we finish? Just to say thank you to, to everybody. And, and also thank you to our host, uh, Kay has been amazing. We, we need her to continue in, the, in this job because she, she has been a, a force of nature. Oh, thanks, Giovanna. It's wonderful working with such amazing people. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything they'd like to just finish with? No? Oh, okay. Well, um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, it, it's been great. And I, I love all the questions that come in and all the interest that we get. And it's, you know, as, as it grows, people are just becoming more and more engaged, uh, which is great. Um, I will make a recording of this available on the UK School of Accord YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and uh, we will keep you updated. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Giovanna. Thanks, Bex. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Simon. And we'll see everybody again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.